Hi again, everybody. This is Wes Moore, the CEO of Robinhood, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined here by one of the most dynamic leaders and thinkers, practitioners in the field, uh, Dean Erica James, who I'm also so, so proud and thankful to also be able to call a friend. Um, this conversation is one I've been looking forward to for a very long time because really the core focus of this conversation uh, and this chat that I wanna have with, uh, with Dean James uh, is really about this, this essential and in, in this in, inextricable link that exists between economic mobility and the racial wealth gap. That these are not emotive conversations, this is data. And it just highlights the point and the importance of being able to use research and data to be able to both understand why we are where we are, but also the things that we need to do to make us better. And so the Dean of the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, Dean Erica James, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. We're, I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Wes, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And I, I really believe as you talk about data, that is part and parcel to what we do at the Wharton School. So I think this is a really beautiful uh, opportunity for, for to connect in, in such an important way. Absolutely. And so, and I know later on, we're going to be joined uh, by some of your colleagues, professors Kessler and, and Lowe, but I want to actually start this conversation, uh, you know, just with us. And, and really for, as we're entering into this, uh, I think it's important that people understand what exactly we mean by the racial wealth gap. And so to start things off, how do you define the racial wealth gap? So people understand not just how, 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 how dangerous this is, but also how it got so hardened in the first place. Yeah, it's such an important question. And fundamentally, I think the racial wealth gap is pretty simple. It's the, the ratio of assets to liabilities for one group versus another group. And when there is a gap or when there's a significant difference in how much people have access to and the resources that they have at their disposal relative to what debts they may incur, uh, when we see that difference so pivotal for one group, and so menial for another, that to me is when we're really creating inequity uh, in societies that is problematic, not just for the group that has the lower wealth, the, the lower wealth to their name, but to our entire society. Because unless everyone is able to thrive and unless everyone is able to, to per participate in the economy in meaningful ways, we can't remain competitive. And when we think about the the racial wealth gap that we're talking about, again, you know, it's a one of a of a, of a ninety percent wealth gap. So basically, you know, a, a, a one in ten net worth gap between black and, and white households. We know that these things are, you know, a did not get there by accident. Uh, you know, this is not mm -hmm. a one group work ten times harder than another group. Um, nor is it something that we have been able to, you know, really make a dent on. In fact, actually, time is showing that this gap is actually getting markedly worse. And so when we consider that, how, how do we have to think through and attack the problem understanding that, uh, that what it is going to be is how do we also unearth things that have already been calcified and brought in really mm. since the inception of the nation? Yeah, and I think it, what you're alluding to is really important because there's oftentimes the perception that it's just around one's individual effort. And if they just worked more or worked harder, that would allow them to participate in the economy in different ways. What I see though are food deserts in communities of color that prevent healthy sustenance, that create health problems, that generate health inequities from those communities that have more access to, to, to grocery stores and, and fresh fruits and vegetables and those kinds of things. What I see are transportation deserts that prevent people from being able to access easily the areas in their communities or in their cities where the jobs are. And if you can't get to your employment, then you don't have the income that's generated from that employment. So those are example healthcare systems. And, and I think if there's anything that this pandemic has revealed is that there is an equity, um, inequity challenges for access to reasonable healthcare. And when you factor in poor food, when you factor in inability to, to access work and job opportunities, when you factor in health issues, all of those make it much more difficult for some groups who have fewer resources to be able to climb their way out of that wealth gap. And so tackling this issue means we have to tackle things that might be seen as tangential 
to the actual work effort that someone's putting into um, having being successful in this community. And I'm really glad you you framed it out this way because you know there will be people who will say, well, you know, listen, this is this is not about racial wealth gaps. This is just economic gaps, right? Mm -hmm. And almost an inability to understand the compounding nature of these two. But I think part of the what you just highlight, whether you're talking about food deserts or or housing appraisal gaps or transportation gaps and healthcare gaps, that it's difficult, if not if not impossible, to talk about these things without understanding that there is a conflation of these two things yes. when it comes to racial gaps and just economic gaps. Why, why is it so important to be able to focus on uh, alleviating the racial wealth disparities as we're having conversations about economic mobility? Yeah, so again, in my mind, it's, it's very clear. So when I was a faculty member and I did research on looking at uh, the differences in how one climbed the corporate ladder, if you will, between blacks and whites, and what I realized is the inability to access the, the networks and some of the human capital initiatives that created opportunity for Blacks in corporate America meant that those companies weren't able to leverage all of the talent in their organizations. And here, what I think we're talking about is as a society, if we're not able to leverage the talent of people of color in this community, of African-Americans, of Latinx community members, of the indigenous populations, if we're not able to invest in and reap the benefits of their talent, then as a society, we can't pretend that we have any chance to remain competitive with, with countries outside of the United States. So I see this as we have to pay attention to the racial dynamics because that is where there has been the least investment, if you will, in all of these areas that have proliferated the wealth, the wealth gap. So to your point, I do think that race and economic viability have been conflated in ways and we have to look at the biases that exist in our decision making. We have to look the, in the biases that exist in policies and, this, and the very severe impact that those kinds of biases have on, on communities of color in this country. And I, and I think when we talk about the, the various elements and in, in segments of our society, that have to really wrestle with this and have to understand their own complicity in it? The answer is all of them, right? That there, there, is, there is not one segment of society that, uh, that can or should be, uh, if we're being honest, be let off the hook for the role mm -hmm. that's been played in creating these measures of disparity, um, nor a single one that does, should not feel a, a measure of, of, of importance in terms of being part of a larger solution. And I know one lever um, that you personally have been an incredibly strong advocate for uh, in your work has been workplace diversity. And so as you think about that and why that becomes such an important lever to be able to, to be able to be pulled, um, you know, can you speak a little bit about, you know, how, how you know, you personally have faced that and how that has helped you develop not just a deeper understanding of the challenges firsthand, but then also, uh, you know, this this unbelievable commitment to making sure that we as a as as workplace and as employers get that right. Yeah. So I I as a black woman certainly have experienced some uh, challenges as most of us have in in you know whatever our professional opportunities that we have sought. But as a scholar, I also really wanted to understand why those challenges exist. And I think it's been both my personal and professional experiences have driven an opportunity for me as uh, now the Dean of the Wharton School to really find ways to utilize the resources that are at my disposal to help address some of these initiatives. Um, I'm excited in a few minutes, I'll introduce some of my colleagues, but you spoke earlier about data. And data matters because that's where decisions can be made. And that's, I think we have to rely on data to take the emotion out of really challenging conversations. And in the workplace, what I have discovered is that people oftentimes want to do what's in the best interest of all of their employees. They wanna make the right decisions. They wanna have fair and equitable hiring practices and fair and equitable compensation practices and promotion practices. But to do that means they've got to break down barriers and, as you said, things that have been calcified in their corporate structure for many years. And to break those things down means we have to actually have to talk about them. And that's where I think it gets tricky 
because people are uncomfortable talking about these issues in the workplace. And in the absence of having those conversations, we tend to see the status quo just perpetuate. So I think part of what I've been really advocating for is how do we start to make comfortable dialogue around race and the way that it has played out or around bias and prejudice and stereotypes and the way that that has played out to create these vast differences in the experiences that blacks and whites have in corporate America. So one way to have those conversations in a, in a more safe way is to look at the data, right? It's not to hold on to the emotion around it or the personal experiences even, but really what does the data tell us and how can we focus on the problem solving based on the data as opposed to getting caught up in the emotion around what people are feeling? Because I think that makes it tricky and I think people are less likely to want to continue to engage if it feels too emotional. Or, or if the fear sort of consumes their ability to move forward. So data research are, I think, the ticket to looking at the issues that need to be addressed and putting together the solutions to address them. And that's where business schools in particular, I think, have a, have a unique advantage because that's what we do is we do research based in data. And you, you think about the idea, and you know, it's, it's funny, sometimes people will say, well, you know, conversations about race and the uh, and the you know interconnectivity of race and lack of economic mobility. They're like those are those are tricky conversations. And 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 I know my answer always is they're actually not tricky conversations. They're the trickiest, right? Mm. They are the most complicated conversations oftentimes we have, and it's a reason why those conversations oftentimes don't happen. It's because yeah. there is a there is a, a fear of saying the wrong thing, or, or, or even if you have people who, are, who, who want to engage in it, um, there's a nervousness about what exactly that means. But these conversations, and part of the reason that we're you know, saying that these are not emotive splurges, these are not playing I told you so or a gotcha, um, this is data. And it's showing how these type of discrepancies and disparities are hurting us all. They are having a market impact, not even just on African-American communities or communities of color, but they're having a market impact on, on all of us. And I think about, you know, you've made history in your appointment as, as the Dean of, of the Wharton School of Business and, and have had such a unique vantage point on, the inter, on the, this intersection of business, academic research, um, and also, frankly, uh, you know, the impact that you and your appointment and who you are has made on, on business school students that are coming up, on people that are looking and considering Wharton, on people inside the field, uh, is going to have tangible and intangible impacts for, for generations to come. But as you think about, you know, our, our you think about, you know, our partnership, how do you think about the role that academia can play in pushing the events and the commitments in 2020 into real action? Because I know it's something you focus deeply on is that on this idea of saying, let's not make 2020 just a year. Let's turn that moment into momentum. So how do you think about how people can take that moment and turn it into a momentum uh, that we can then have a lasting longer term impact on real action? One of the most heartening things that I have realized in my time at Wharton so far is that there is the momentum, we don't have to push the momentum at this point. There is a generation of young people, meaning students coming into business schools or, or higher education in general, who are passionate about these issues, who care deeply about these issues. And in fact, at 7.30 this morning, I was on a phone call with probably 15 MBA students, and this was the topic of our conversation that they brought to me. I didn't have to push them into this. I didn't have to you know, drag them pulling and screaming to talk about diversity. They wanted me to understand what they're in fact already doing and opportunities that they see for the Wharton School to advance our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I don't think that's just happening at Wharton. I think that's happening at many schools and business schools across the country. So I think that um, the, the role that we can play is to start to listen to our students who are the future and then ensuring that we can prepare through our curricular and co-curricular activities, uh, opportunities for them to develop as leaders in diverse organizations. It's not a matter of whether the companies that they will be joining will be diverse. They're already diverse and they will become more and more diverse. And the question is, how do we help create the skill set for people to operate in those environments 
and frankly, to lead in those environments. Because once they become supervisors and managers and directors and vice presidents, they're the ones who are gonna be making the decisions for how we bring people into the company, how we reward people, how we um, create fair and equitable practices. And that learning can and should be starting in business schools. Thank you, thank you, and you know, and I, uh, and I know you have uh, have your colleagues here as well, uh, and so I, I'd love to uh, love to turn it over to you to bring them into this conversation as well. Thank you, Wes, and uh, I am. Thank you for having us all. But more importantly, I am so thrilled to give an opportunity for. Wharton to demonstrate the power of its academic prowess and its research and its scholarship. And one of the beautiful things, again, that I've observed is that there are so many people at our school who, who care about this matter from a, a research standpoint and are doing scholarship on all manner of issues connected to equity and, and ways that we can close the, the wealth gap. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, two of my colleagues who are in faculty in our Department of Business Economics and Public Policy. The first one is Jed, Judd Kessler. He's an associate professor with us at the Wharton School. And then my other colleague is Corinne Lowe, an assistant professor, both from um, uh, business policy, business economics and public policy. So thank you both for joining us. I'm thrilled to be engaged in conversation with you and give you a chance to talk a little bit about your, your research. So I know that the two of you have been engaged in a project that's looking at um, hiring practices and you have some really interesting uh, findings around that. But I'd first like to know, how did you get involved in this research and what drove you to wanna to explore this issue of hiring and equity and hiring practices? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what we saw is that we knew there was a lot of evidence of discrimination in the workforce in general, but, you know, in terms of the more prestigious companies, a lot of companies thought that they were immune from this. They said, we have diversity initiatives, we have a DEI coordinator, you know, we've sort of got it figured out. And um, we wanted to know if that was true, because we definitely still had a sense like, well, it still isn't working. There still isn't a lot of diversity in terms of, um, you know, the CEOs and the, the C-suite and General and you know the leaders of these top organizations, um, and so we wanted to do a kind of checkup specifically on some of these more prestigious companies because talking about the racial wealth gap, you know, these are the types of positions. Um, where people can build careers, where they can accumulate wealth and economic power. So who gets those super prestigious jobs, you know, that the Wharton MBA students, for example, might be competing for is really important in terms of racial equity and justice. Thank you. And and Jed, would you add anything to that in terms of no, the Corinne, motivation Corinne, for this research? Yeah, I mean, Corinne uh, uh, hit the nail on the head where, you know, it, it's clearly important. Uh, we, we see that firms are striving to do better. And the question is, you know, are they doing better? The firms that say that they care about these issues, are they eliminating the kind the problematic gaps in their hiring practices that uh, we've, we've observed in research for a long time? So Judd, since you have the floor, why don't you tell us what did you find? How did you do this research, first of all, and what were some of the key findings? Yeah, excellent. So uh, there was a, a way of doing research on this, uh, you know, historically uh, that's been around for a while that's called a resume audit study. And uh, the way that that worked was that you'd send resumes with uh, names that were indicative of race and gender to uh, firms that were that would accept cold resumes and evaluate cold resumes, and that was the 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 way of doing things. And, and what researchers found was that uh, minority names at the top of resumes made them less likely to receive calls back from from firms. Um, and as Karen mentioned, what we were particularly interested in uh, was was not the the kinds of firms that would take cold resumes uh, like that. We wanted to know if the firms that were hiring at prestigious institutions, the same firms that said they you know, really cared about diversity and, and had diversity and inclusion initiatives, we wanted to, to evaluate them and see if they were displaying uh, these problematic biases. So uh, what we did was we built a, a new tool that we call incentivized resume rating that uh, was designed to, to do that. So I'll let Corinne give the, the rundown of it. And the key innovation of this tool is that instead of kind of tricking firms by sending them fake resumes where we had changed the name on top, we actually told firms that we were doing a study and that they were evaluating hypothetical resumes. But the incentivized part is that we rewarded them for rating these hypothetical resumes by matching them with real 
UPenn candidates who were a good fit for their preferences based on their ratings of the hypothetical resumes. So we provide an incentive for them to really have a real recruiter do an excellent job going through these 40 hypothetical resumes and saying which ones they wanted because we said at the end of this, we're going to use our best, you know, Wharton People Analytics tools to match you with um, the candidates that are going to be a good fit for your position based on that diagnostic that you did. And then we could use the diagnostic to do this sort of, you know, diversity check to see if they actually had the preference for diverse candidates that they said they did. Because we, um, these are firms where 90% of them uh, said that they were seeking to increase gender and racial diversity in their hiring. So that was their stated objective. And we wanted to see if, you know, they were actually doing that. Um, and what we found is that even though 90% of them said in our hiring we consider you know racial and gender diversity to be a positive factor we found you know absolutely sort of zero preference for um you know female or minority candidates across the board on average and then when we zeroed in specifically on stem firms we actually found a large penalty for female and minority candidates and because we also had the gpa randomly assigned to each resume along with you know the the race and gender through the name we could quantify this penalty in terms of how many extra GPA points do you have to make um, as a female minority candidate to get treated equally as a white male candidate. And that number is that a female or minority candidate with a 4.0 is treated the same as a white male candidate with a 3.75 in STEM fields. And so the female or minority candidate had to have 0.25, a quarter of a GPA point, which is not easy to come by, extra to actually get rated the same. And these were among the prestigious STEM firms who said, we want to increase diversity. Fascinating. What Have you hypothesized why STEM firms in particular showed that kind of gap versus some of the other firms that you were exploring? So we think that everything that we were seeing was implicit bias. And in fact, we see some evidence that um, firms think that they have a positive preference and then an implicit bias sort of undoes that positive preference. And so when we talk about implicit bias, the more it's really your brain making a snap decision based on sort of the input that it has. And the input is the historical data about who has succeeded in this space in the past, right? And so the reason we think it's implicit bias is we actually saw that the discrimination increased when the recruiters became fatigued close to the end of the survey and were spending less time per resume. And that's when we saw that they actually discriminated more. And so what we think might be happening is that firms may have that kind of conscious positive preference that they say actually oh I'm, i i want to hire some you know female candidates i want to hire some minority candidates but it's getting undone by their implicit bias and in the case of stem the implicit bias is so strong because the historical data is so biased one direction that it's even creating a negative bias and our hint that firms may sort of think they have a positive bias or you know consciously want to have a positive bias was in two other things that we saw we saw that um female and minority candidates were also rated less likely to accept a position for the same quality of candidate. The firms thought that they were not going to accept the position if it was offered. And firms gave female and minority candidates, and this is all firms, not just STEM, less credit for prestigious internships. So how do we make sense of those two results? Well, the hiring the, that you're less likely to accept an offer, if you have a theory of the world that all firms are looking to increase diversity and then we're looking to increase diversity. So everybody's going after these candidates. You might think these candidates are harder to get. And similarly, if that's your theory of the world, that everyone's going after these candidates, then suddenly the prestigious name in terms of an internship for a female or minority candidate means less because you think, oh, they might have gotten that because that firm was seeking to increase diversity rather than because of their, you know, sort of true quality. But, you know, what's such a, you know, like a er, you know, moment about that is that we didn't see that the firms were not giving preference to female and minority candidates. So these candidates are being, you know, penalized for a purely fictional diversity preference. And that's where we really call this, you know, a gap between what firms think that they're doing or want to be doing and what they're actually doing. So Judd, what can we do? How do we advise companies uh, now that you have access to this information? What would you what feedback would you give them on ways to manage this outcome? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. It's the important question. Uh, the first thing is to Corinne's point uh, about what we found in the research uh, that 
you know, you, you might not be doing as well as you think you're doing. A, a trying is obviously the first step and, and, you know, you want to be focused on this, on this important issue. Uh, but just because you have those intentions, those positive intentions does not necessarily mean that the processes that you have in place uh, are, are implementing those preferences. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the key takeaway that these are firms that say that they value diversity in hiring, want to develop value diversity in hiring, and then when they evaluate resumes, and particularly when they get fatigued, uh, this implicit bias sneaks in. And so, you know, the first thing is recognize that this is uh, something that you're trying to solve, but you may not have solved it yet. And I think that the second point relates to the uh, conversation you two were having earlier about the importance of data in these processes. So, you know, if you want to know if you are suffering as a firm from these kinds of biases, you know, you need to look at the data to, to generate a, an assessment of that. You need to look at your hiring funnel. You have to ask questions about the, the percentage of folks of different backgrounds who are being interviewed, uh, you know, of, of those candidates who apply. You need to see what fraction of those folks are getting uh, job offers. And, and that kind of data uh, is, is, you know, very important to actually be able to, to make sure that these biases are not s sneaking in. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the things I know is true about scholarship is that there's always something else on the horizon. So how will you, how will you build off of this line of research into more areas of, of study connected to the racial wealth gap or, or biases in general? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're continuing with this research and we're partnering with firms, uh, you know, in a variety of ways um, to see if, you know, firms can improve their practices. So, you know, one of the things that that we're able to do in our study, Corinne mentioned, we match uh, firms to real Penn students. Uh, and so one of the things that we're able to do with our uh, with with our tools, we can identify preferences that you have for candidates based on GPA and, uh, you know, and, and the internships and skills and major. Uh, and we can identify candidates that fit your needs, um, but we can do that without bringing in the race or gender bias, you know, at, at all. And so we're interested in, in bringing that to firms and, and seeing the benefits that can come from that. And that's one of the sort of next steps for us. Yeah, well, thank you. I know that both of you have a life outside of the Wharton School and have certain interests. And, and uh, I wanted to give you a chance to share a bit more about that. So uh, Corinne, tell us about, you know, how you are uh, engaged in matters with, with the racial wealth gap and family structure and how investment decisions are made. Yeah, so I have a, both a research interest in this and then sort of a personal interest in this. And so um, in terms of my research, I have been studying the way that the racial wealth gap um, could actually lead to gaps in terms of family structure and then in turn investments in the next generation. And so this is something that, you know, there hasn't really been an awareness of that actually wealth plays an important role in marriage. And so I have work showing that um, the reason wealth can be really important in marriage is that marriage is essentially a contract. And it's a contract that asks people to take risks that may sort of interfere with their own earning capacity, but help the couple or the family as a whole. So that could be, you know, moving across the country when your spouse has a job offer, but it actually is going to hurt your career. Or it could be staying home for a couple of years with kids, right? And the ability to take that risk means that you relies on having some form of insurance in case that contract is to dissolve. And people with wealth have that insurance because wealth through the marriage contract, things like a family home, are divided equally in the case of divorce. And so if we know, as we do, that there's not equal access to things like home ownership and things like wealth accumulation, it turns out there's not equal access to strong family formation either. And this is a way of taking this out of the domain of, you know, preferences and who wants to get married and who doesn't, and actually talking about access. The access is not equal to this type of contract, and that can have consequences in terms of being able to invest in the next generation, because if that investment requires somebody saying, okay, I'm take a couple years off to do this for my child, that might not be possible in a situation where you don't have that insurance because you don't have the wealth to make sure that you're going to be okay in case the relationship dissolves. And then in terms of my personal interest in this, you know, I think the racial wealth gap underlies so many things. It's such a, it's such a crucial thing in terms of understanding our society. And so, um, 
in the beginning of, you know, I guess not the beginning of COVID, but earlier now over the summer, a lot of people who are living in homeless shelters were moved into hotels to protect them um, for their own safety. And I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and my neighborhood had a absolutely disgusting, visceral pushback against this, say, we don't want these people here. And these were people who, you know, the people who were pushing back against it had never had to worry about where they were laying their head, had never had to worry about where their next meal was coming from. And they were resisting people being given access to their neighborhood to save their lives, literally to save their lives from being in a congregate setting where COVID was going to spread. And so I said, you know, this, I just had this clarity, like, this is segregation. It's not, you know, people outwardly saying, oh, we don't want black people in our neighborhood. It's people saying, oh, we're worried about our kids' safety, when in fact, this is a decision that's being made for the safety of these individuals who needed to be protected from COVID. And so I formed a very different type of neighborhood organization, a neighborhood organization standing up for inclusion and welcoming in our neighborhood. We call the Upper West Side Open Hearts Initiative. And we're now helping other neighborhoods do the same thing to say, you know, if we're going to solve the racial wealth gap, it takes individuals choosing inclusion over sort of protecting whatever it is, their property price whatever it is that they think they're standing up for, right? It takes, it's a million tiny decisions of people saying, you know, yes, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to have that here. I'm going to live my values, you know, right here, rather than, you know, putting up the walls and keeping people out. Well, Thank you both so much. Wes, I think you can see pretty clearly why I so love this job because I get to spend my days talking with wonderful colleagues who are so passionate about work that I think is just gonna continue to grow in importance. And so thank you, Corinne and Judd, and thank you, Wes, for, for inviting us to be a part of this. And listen, and, and, and thank you. And you, now you think you can see why I love this so much because I get a chance to be around the three of you. Uh, and so this, this, this was not just incredibly important and informative, uh, but also just incredibly lightning. And, and then, uh, and we're all just so, so, so grateful for you. So Professor Zlow, uh, Professor Kessler, thank you so much. Dean James, uh, you know, I think you, you said before where he's like, I, you know, there's a quote that you had that I, I, I really resonates with me where he said, you know, if we can create social media platforms, if we can put people on the moon, if we can have self-driving cars, then there's very little that we can't do. So the fact that we have not yet created a more diverse work environment means we simply have not prioritized it. And so this conversation uh, has been remarkable because it doesn't just say the, the why, but, uh, but the three of you have also really highlighted the how. So thank you so much for not just today, but for everything you consistently do for all of us. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Thanks.